Good morning everyone. We want to welcome you, especially if you're here for the first time. Welcome and welcome to New Viners far and wide, wherever you are on this planet. It's yeah. great to be worshipping together with you today. And here in Australia, I'm very much looking forward to the fact that there's two weeks of winter left oh, and then the spring two. is coming. You do like about spring. Time. <laughs> hey, we've got a good morning uh, coming up. We're going to be uh, hearing a story from a young new viner of some exciting things that he's involved in doing. Our musos have put together a special item for us. Uh, but we're just really hoping that you open your heart this morning to the things that the Lord wants to uh, say. Uh, so as we just prepare our hearts for worship, maybe you want to crank the volume up. Gee, we've got some good musos, haven't we? We have some hey? great musos. So thankful for all the musos who do their bit every week. So thankful for all the kids' ministry people who are back looking after our kids in our building uh, this morning as well. Mm -hmm. How about we just pray and just uh, commit our day to the Lord. Father, uh, it is good to be here. Lord, thank you for your continued work in our lives, in our lives and, and through us to others. Lord, we commit this time before you. Lord, let there be something in the music as we uh, hum and sing along. Lord, let there be something in the word. Let there be stories here that, uh, that just uh, instruct us and help us to move us forward. Lord, we commit this morning before you in the name of Jesus. Have your way in it, we ask. Amen. Amen. Enjoy.
Thanks, Musa. It's for a great time of worship. Excellent. Hey, uh, we just want to uh, pause and encourage you with your giving. Um, you know, God pours out so much into our lives uh, in this strange season. We just want to encourage you to continue being faithful to God, being receptive to the things that he'd be challenging you about with your finances. So how about we do just commit our mm. uh, own personal finances and the church's finances before you. We really do encourage you in that tithing and offering. Uh, encourage you too in your global giving. Um, you're probably aware that we've gone on to a month by month uh, sort of budget with the, the global giving that's based on those regular amounts that just keep coming in each week and each fortnight and each month. So thank you very much for that. But I'd just like us to pray too that, that God would just open our eyes to see the needs around us that as you know just individuals we can get, lend a helping hand and that sort of stuff so uh, let, let's just pray and commit that to the Lord Father we uh, we do want to thank you uh, for your bountiful provision to us Lord the very breath that we're breathing right now that's sustaining us Lord you've given that to us Lord thank you for this uh, country and its rich heritage thank you for the friends and uh, all of the Really, really good stuff that we just take for granted every day. Lord, again, we do commit our tithes and our offerings before you. Lord, we commit our global partners before you. Lord, thank you for the courage that's being um, shown by so many of them in their faithfulness in difficult circumstances. Lord, we do ask that you would open our eyes to see those in need around us and how we can help them. Lord, we, uh, yeah, we thank you that you're the provider. We, we, we give, Lord, as an act of worship to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We do. Yeah. Some of you will remember that um, some months back we won a grant to yes. have a playground put into the grounds here. Yeah, and cool. a little birdie told me recently that the contractor should be on site very, very soon. Yes. And hopefully we should have a working playground before Christmas. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, so the contractor will probably get his machinery on, on site maybe in the next week, at least in the next fortnight. Yeah, about a three month kind of a deal to yeah. get it up and happening. So uh, we'll be needing to do a bit of work with fencing and stuff like that, so so watch this space. But yeah, we're really sort of hoping that becomes quite a visual thing at the front of our property and a real practical help for, for families, particularly with you know those kids under 10. For when everything eventually starts. Yeah, moving. the coffee yeah. shop, the playground, yeah. the cool. Way. It'll happen. Hey, we're just going to uh, hand over now. Isaac's got a cracking good interview uh, to go, so uh, open your heart to this. Hey there, New Vine. Welcome to one of our first New Vine stories. Uh, we got a whole bunch of people in the life of our church that off their own bat are involved in a whole bunch of great initiatives that we really want you to hear about. Um, so over the coming weeks, we're gonna be interviewing a few different people and hearing about what they are up to. And today we're kicking that off with a much loved New Viner, Dan Robbo, how are you? Good, thank you, how are you? Very well. Um, for those of you who don't know, Dan and his wife, Han, are pretty involved in our evening service, but you've been around New Viner for a long time. Yeah, yeah, good while. I was born pretty close to the start, so... Yeah, nearly from day dot. You're all from day dot. Yeah, I think, I think I was born a couple of weeks after the first yeah. service. So. Yeah. so a long time. And uh, many of you, uh, many people will know your parents, Greg and Cheryl. They're, uh, they're not in Australia at the moment, are they? No, they live in the Netherlands. Yeah. Um, we're working pretty hard to get them back there, so... Yes. Yeah. Come on back, Greg and Cheryl. That's it. Yeah, but they were, they've been involved in that church for a very long time. Um, and Dan's, Dan is involved with some good stuff that we're going to hear about. But just firstly, Dan, what, uh, what do you do for work? Uh, I'm a graphic designer. Yeah, and uh, you did some training down, you went to uni down in Melbourne. Yep. Disappeared for a couple of years. That's right, yeah. But have since come back, been yep. working as a graphic designer. Um, and what we're talking about today is your shirt, Born, uh, is a company that you are involved with and um, involved in getting off the ground what do you what is it what do you do yeah well born is a social enterprise um, and we sell sustainable clothing um, that has been dipped with a insect repellent compound yeah um, and then 50% uh, of the profits from that go towards uh, fighting malaria and other mosquito borne diseases right yeah. so a mosquito dip shirt sounds pretty much perfect for 2287 yes yes yeah. Yeah. Um, but other than just being good shirts, uh, the back end of what you just said, the proceeds from that go to something far greater than just making money off shirts, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the, the, the stats are pretty amazing. Um, over um, 200 million people 
uh, get affected by malaria every year. Um, and that equates to about a child dying every two minutes, um, which is pretty uh, pretty horrific uh, stat. And so the, the thing about malaria is that we actually already have a cure and we already have um, ways to fight it. Uh, and the main, the main issue when it comes to uh, in those field countries um, where it's a real problem is actually funding. Um, mm. We have a solution, we know what to do, um, but funding is the main issue. And so that was something that we wanted to, to really uh, be able to contribute to uh, pushing the world a bit closer towards a cure for malaria. Yeah, that is cool. Good on you. That's a great thing to be a part of. Um, and whilst Born itself isn't a Christian company, no doubt for you, uh, your belief and your desire to follow Jesus has shaped uh, your thinking and your reasoning behind why you would be a part of something like this. So I guess just for us, um, as Christians, to get a snapshot of uh, uh, why is it for you there's this pull towards social justice and making sure that the least or, or often those that the world would rather choose to forget than get their hands dirty, what is it for you that causes you to be, be a part of the solution there? Yeah, I think uh, for me, looking at the person of Jesus and um, his character, everything he did um, was uh, not for himself, it was for other people. Mm. And uh, he loved others and went above and beyond to help other people. Yeah. Uh, and everything he did was um, with that consideration of how, how it affects others. He asks us to, to love God and love others. And so I think, um, yeah, when it comes to the clothes we wear and what we choose to purchase and, and how we choose to contribute when it comes to waste and sustainability mm. um, and where we decide to how we decide to vote with our money, I think um, providing a way for people to, to both receive a, a, um, something that helps them, a shirt that prevents the annoyance of mozzies here, but that is also contributing to a greater cause. Mm. Um, for me, I think that's living out Jesus where we are here and now. Yeah. That's so good. Good on you. Um, well, for us as a church family, if people want to know a little bit more, find out uh, about you know more about the shirts or more about where the proceeds are headed. Uh, how do we find out more? Yeah, for sure. Um, we're on social media, so Instagram's born underscore clothing, uh, and our website's bornclothing.com. Yeah. Um, jump on, have a look. Um, they're open for pre-orders now, so it'll be a couple of weeks um, before we ship. But uh, yeah, we're really excited. There's yeah. lots of new new designs coming through, and yeah. Yeah, oh, that's yeah. great. Well, good on you for what you're doing. Um, New Vine, I would encourage you to have a look, but also just be praying for Dan and his colleagues as they try and get this off the ground. Um, and just be praying into the issue of malaria, that we would uh, be a part of a generation that sees that put to an end. So good on you for what you're doing, and uh, thanks for all you do in the life of our church. Thanks, Art. Thanks, mate.
g'day, my name's Luke. It's great to be with you today. Special welcome if you're visiting. We're continuing our series uh, looking at who Jesus is. And to do this, we've been looking at the I am statements that are recorded in the Gospel according to John. Hey, one of the things I love most about being a dad, I've got three boys, uh, is I have an excuse to watch animated kids movies. Uh, I don't know if that's true for you. If you've got your favourite one, feel free to put it up in the comment section. Uh, one of mine would have to be the Madagascar series. I love it. I, I find that I actually start quoting lines from the movie in just like day-to-day -day dialogue. That's a problem. It means I'm watching far too many of them. Um, but recently I've noticed with my youngest, Flynn, he's three, he's been learning about death and I hear him talk about this, you know, like oh, something simple might happen and go, oh no, I might die. Uh, but this has come through some of the movies he's watched, animated kids movies. The Good Dinosaur is one of them. Another one uh, is a movie he's been watching lately uh, called The Smurfs. They've got a bunch of different series of movies, but this particular one involves a scene where one of the favourite Smurfs dies. Now I won't let you know who that is because I don't want to um, spoil the movie for you just in case you're planning on watching it right after you finish watching me, not before, thank you very much. Um, but I found that my three year old, he actually doesn't like the scene, he, you know, he's found that if he hides his face behind a pillow or he runs out of the room while the dying scene happens and everyone's sad, he doesn't have to deal with those bad emotions. Uh, but then he runs back because there's this incredible moment where miraculously Smurf powers combined, uh, they bring the dead Smurf back to life. Um, and he loves that bit. That is, uh, goes without saying. Now, at the risk of stirring up unwanted emotions, I actually want you for a minute just to consider maybe someone that you have lost or said goodbye to uh, in this life. And then I want you to take a moment to consider what it would be like to have them back. What would, uh, what would overcome you? you know, how quickly would your grief be turned to great joy? Well, as we continue this Jesus Is series today, we're actually looking at a story where Jesus declared that he is the resurrection and the life. And after declaring this, he goes on to raise his friend Lazarus from the dead. Now, if you've ever wondered if there is life after death, this story today is the answer. What Jesus did here was not a once-off miracle, but it was a demonstration of his power and his authority over death that led to his own death and resurrection uh, and that actually paved the way towards resurrection life being offered to absolutely anybody who would choose to put their faith and trust in Jesus. Now this story we're looking at it's found uh, in John chapter 11 so please get your Bibles out or there's a tab on the side where you can click on Bible and you can look up certain passages but we're going to be camping out in John chapter 11. Now this story is actually quite long. There's a lot of different verses in it. So I'm just going to give you a bit of a summary of how this hangs together. Then we're going to go back and look at specific verses and see what we can learn about Jesus and also about our response to him. So in this story, we've got Lazarus. He's one of the main characters. He had an important role. Uh, we've also got his two sisters, Martha and Mary. Now, some of you might know a bit about Martha and Mary. There's another story where uh, Jesus visits a house and uh, Martha's very busy. She's very, you know, very studious and getting jobs done. She's fussing over dinner and, and all the things that needed to be prepared while Mary, her sister, is sitting at Jesus' feet, just listening to him, um, soaking up him being there with them. And, you know, Martha's ticked off about that and saying, can't you get my sister to help? Uh, not an uncommon scenario even today, isn't it? A statement like that. Um, so they're the two sisters. Another one is a story you might know is Martha when uh, she poured perfume on Jesus and she wiped his feet with her hair. So we've got the, this family uh, and they were very close with Jesus. Jesus loved, you know, it says that he loved this family. He was very close with them. Now, what happens here is that Lazarus becomes incredibly sick and he is living in the town of Bethany. Now Bethany, this town, that was about, um, about two miles west of Jerusalem. And they're there with the two sisters and his sickness becomes so severe that the sisters have no, um, no other answer other than to send for help. And what they do is they send for Jesus. Now the problem is Jesus is not close by. Uh, he had just been in Jerusalem and around there and had this sort of confrontation with the Jewish leaders where he was sort of confessing that he was from the Father and that he was in the Father and the Father was in him. And they're like, blasphemy, and they wanted to kill him. They tried to seize him. They tried to stone him and the disciples, but they escaped. And what they did is they left and they went uh, right over 
east of the Jordan River to actually another place where John, uh, his cousin, used to baptize people. And that was called Bethany also. Now, the distance between these two places is a, probably about 35 kilometers. And so when uh, Mary and Martha send for help, they send a runner, no, obviously no cars, that's quite a journey. Uh, I wouldn't be a good runner in that kind of a situation. To put it into perspective, that might be like, you know, someone in your family gets sick and there's a doctor at Cessnock and the only way to get there is you send, you know, one of your friends, hey, can you leg it for me? And go and get the doctor and then, and then journey back with them. Tough times. They're very, very desperate times for those people. Uh, so that's what's happening. But the word gets to Jesus. And when word gets there, all this distance away, Jesus actually says this statement. He says, this sickness will not end in death. Um, and then he decided to stay where he was for a few more days. An incredibly interesting uh, choice for Jesus to not rush back to someone he loved, but to stay where he was and what he was doing for the next few days. So after these days had gone past, Jesus then tells his disciples the plan to head back towards Jerusalem, uh, to which they completely object, saying, are you serious, Jesus? Do uh, you, you realize, do you remember just a few days back what they tried to do to us there? Um, but Jesus reminded them uh, of the importance of going back and said, look, our, our friend Lazarus, he's fallen asleep. I need to go there and wake him up. And again, they're like, oh, that's a good thing. Let him sleep. Sleeping's good. That'll help him get better. And Jesus you know, has to shoot straight with them. Look, guys, Lazarus is dead. We need to go. Uh, so they start heading back and upon their arrival, they discover that Lazarus has actually been in the tomb for four days. And as he gets close, uh, Martha hears that Jesus is on his way and she goes out to meet him and obviously so upset and distraught, is declaring things like, you know, Jesus, if only you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And then he has this beautiful interaction with Martha where he states to her, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even though they die. Anyone who lives and believes in me will never die, Jesus says to her. Martha then goes and summons his sister and says, the teacher is here, he wants to see you. So then Mary runs out and uh, I think Mary probably could be described in temperament as a feeler. You know, she's probably just so sad that, that Jesus wasn't there and didn't even want to go out to meet him. But then she comes out, falls at his feet. And she's like, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And then this powerful little picture where Jesus sees the grief and he sees the situation of everything that's going on. And it says that Jesus was deeply moved and even troubled within himself to the point that it then says this, the shortest verse in the Bible, Jesus wept. Now, it wasn't like the customary wailing of the day uh, that was, you know, would, a period of mourning would go on for a certain number of days. This is more just like a shedding of tears. It is quite internal weeping of Jesus. But then he goes to the tomb where the body had been laid. He asked for the stone to be rolled away. And then with this authoritative voice, Jesus simply calls out, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man walks out from the tomb. Now, an incredibly powerful story. And now, look, our main hope in creating this series uh, where we're looking at these I am statements of Jesus throughout John's account of the gospel would be that we would continue to discover afresh who Jesus is. Now, I don't know how you're going with that at the moment. I don't know uh, where you're at in your relationship with Jesus at the moment, but we often throw out lines, don't we, like, Jesus, yes, I know you're everything. You're all I ever want. You're all I ever need. You know, we learned the other week, Jesus is the bread of life. Whoever, you know, receives Jesus will never be hungry for anything ever again. He totally satisfies. But here we are in a season uh, during COVID where even our normal spiritual routines of like being a part of the church and meeting together, a lot of that's been stripped away. And I wonder how much that's stripped away our relationship with Jesus. Uh, if that's true for you, uh, we're hoping that through this series where we just look afresh at the person of Jesus, who he is, what he's like, and how we're meant to interact with him, that we would be captivated afresh by this game-changing saviour who makes all the difference in the world and that you would come to a place of, of loving him like you never have before, of journeying with him and allowing him to be everything that you could ever hope for in this life. Now, there are so many things we could pull out of this story, but I simply want to look at uh, the different characters 
in this story today, starting with Jesus to reveal truth about uh, who he is, what he's like, but also then to look at uh, how we as his followers should respond to him. So firstly, let's look at Jesus. And to do this, I'm going to look at Jesus' priorities. I'm going to look at his humanity. And then I'm going to look at his divinity. Um, So to look at Jesus' priorities, I want us to read John 11 and verses 4 to 6. I'm reading from the NIV. And here in 4 to 6 it says, um, When he heard this, so the sisters had sent word to Jesus where it says, you know, Lord, the one you love is sick. And it says, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Now that seems crazy, doesn't it? That he has just got word that someone he loves is sick. They're sending this desperate plea. They've sent a runner, you know, from Walls End to Cessnock, for example, to get him. And upon hearing that, he decides to stay where he was. Now, I'm sure we've all been let down by someone before. You know, maybe in our time of deepest need where we've called on someone for help and they have failed to come through. It has hurt us greatly. Uh, Maybe you've been the one who has done the letting down. Um, If you're a dad, get used to it. I feel like I do that all the time uh, with my kids. But I've got no doubt at all that Jesus wanted to be there for the people he cared deeply about. However, he only said and did what he heard and saw his Father in heaven saying and doing. God's will for Jesus was far more important than the will of people on earth, even if it meant disappointing them for a time. We also learn that Jesus' highest motivation was for the glory of God to be revealed. Although this story brought a measure of pain in the moment for those he loved, he knew that the revealing of God's glory was far more important than their um, temporary pain that they might have been going through. I want you for a moment to consider the nature of your own personal prayer life to see whether it lines up with the kind of um, heart and priorities that Jesus demonstrated. Because our prayer life, it it says a lot about our motivation, says a lot about our priorities. And if you find that even within your own prayer life, it's mainly characterized by uh, you getting your will uh, and you pursuing your own comfort, uh, it's rather different, isn't it? Than Jesus setting this example where his highest priority was God's will being done and God's glory being revealed. So let's learn that that's who Jesus is, and I think he's setting a good model for us there um, of how we can follow on from that also. So they were Jesus' priorities, God's glory and God's will being done. Um, We then look at Jesus' humanity in verse 33 to 38. So let's read that now. So verse 33 to 38 says, When Jesus saw her weeping, now this is Mary, And the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And there's this shortest verse, just in verse 35. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, see how much he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? And Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with the stone laid across the entrance. Now, there are a heap of different views from a number of different commentators on what actually caused Jesus to be so moved um, emotionally here, to to show his emotions and to to weep like he did. Um, And we can't deny the fact that Jesus, though, was deeply moved by the immense grief that was being carried by Mary and the others around. There's no doubt that Jesus sees the pain and he is moved by that. Now, some commentators are going to say things like, you know, Jesus was maybe moved by the loss of a friend, a bit like the people thought in the passage. Uh, that's pretty unlikely because Jesus knew right from the beginning that this sickness wouldn't end in death. You know, he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. Um, some think he was moved by the demonstration of deep sorrow and grief that was around him, highly likely. Uh, many will comment that Jesus was deeply moved and troubled by the impact of the enemy called death. Seeing how much sin and death and destruction has on the lives of people and maybe Jesus was almost angered at uh, the effects of sin and death 
uh, and it, it motivated him to want to do something about it. John Piper, uh, he has some thoughts where he, he thinks that Jesus was possibly deeply moved and troubled by the way his love and care for people was continually questioned. At least three times I go, you know, Jesus, if you had been here, it's really like saying, if you'd really cared, you would have come and you would have done something. And maybe Jesus' um, motivation here, maybe Jesus' care for people is being questioned and he's, he's frustrated by that. Maybe he's deeply moved by that in some way also. But regardless of these different views, we must be reminded of the fact that Jesus sees our pain and he draws near to the brokenhearted. Jesus was fully human and fully God, uh, this God man, uh, while he was here on the earth. And he can sympathize with us. He can empathize with us. Um, and he is someone who will meet us right where we're at. Whatever pain you're going through right now, I want you to know that Jesus is the kind of savior who sees that. He knows that and he wants to be with you through that. So we see Jesus' priorities, we see his humanity in this story, uh, but we also see his incredible divinity, you know, this divine nature where we know without a shadow of a doubt that he's come from God. And this was really like the reversal of a, of a nail in the coffin when it came to questioning whether Jesus really was from God. And when Jesus declared that he is the resurrection and the life, and these come from the, the end of the passage, verses 25 and 26, and then through to verse 41 to 43, um, where you know Jesus looks up to he um, looked up to heaven. He said, "Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me." When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, "Lazarus, come out!" And the dead man came out. Um, if there was any question about whether Jesus was from God, um, that was dead and buried now because Jesus has demonstrated that he has power and authority just to speak the words and was able to raise the dead man to new life. When Jesus declared that he is the resurrection and the life, he was giving a promise of resurrection life for people. And you know the, the summary of that is, whoever believes in me, Jesus said, will live even though they might experience death on the earth. But also, it was a promise of eternal or abundant life where Jesus said, whoever lives and believes in me will actually never die. You know, new birth is started within them. It's like they've been born again, this eternal life within them right here, right now. Now, performing miraculous signs and healing uh, was one thing, but giving a simple verbal command to a decaying, smelling corpse to rise up was a certain sign that Jesus was no ordinary man. He has power over life and death. It was a demonstration of his divinity. Uh, if you've ever been concerned about life after death or what happens when you die, Jesus continues to give an invitation to everyone for us to put our faith and trust in him, to believe in him. He promises that those who do that will not perish, but they will have everlasting life. Even though we're all going to face death at some point, we can have an assurance, this wonderful assurance of eternal life through faith in Jesus. But more than that, we also have access to the abundant life uh, right now through the spirit of Jesus who breathes new life into us. Now, I want to quickly just have a look at some of the other characters uh, from this story in a way that reveals what Jesus desires to do with us and through us uh, as we relate to him, particularly in a season of waiting. Now, I know straight away, many of you are like, I don't want to hear about this. I don't like waiting, particularly when it comes to waiting on God, because, hey, who knows what God's timing is? Who knows uh, when God is going to work? Um, absolutely, we don't. Sometimes we don't at all. And the good thing is, though, we can trust God that his timing is perfect, that he knows what he is doing. So on a first look at the disciples, we're going to jump back to verses 14 and 15. And in this little passage here, it says, uh, So then he told them plainly, when they weren't quite getting it about G Lazarus being asleep, he said plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, this is verse 15, For your sake, I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe. But let us now go to him. And what I want to suggest here is that Jesus desires to see growth in us. Jesus desires to see growth in us. 
Jesus says to his disciples, for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there because there's going to be some growth that takes place through this tricky, um, painful experience. And there was great waiting that was happening for certain people in this story. Um, but Jesus was able to do a different work here. He was able to do something where he was seeing growth in his disciples. We also look at a little cameo from Thomas, one of the disciples. And this is great where Thomas sort of puts in this bold claim and like it's the very next verse, verse 16, and says, then Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, come on, let's go with Jesus that we may die with him. Uh, they were heading back to Jerusalem. He's like, oh, well, it looks like our time is up, but come on, let's go. Let's die with Jesus. And what I want us to take away from this short little cameo from Thomas is that Jesus desires to continually show grace towards us. The reason why I say that is because the disciples were good at making bold claims, but they're not following through. Now, if you think about Peter as well, Peter had this great declaration of faith in Jesus and then a quick turnaround three times denied that he even knew him. I wonder for you, I know it's true for me, how many times we say things, oh Lord, I'll follow you anywhere. Um, yeah, Lord, just say the word and, and I'll and I'm going to go where you lead me. And we make these bold claims, Jesus, you're everything I could ever need. But how much does that really play out in our lives? How much is possibly that just head knowledge, not heart knowledge? Um, we, we rattle off these things. Um, but the good thing is, Jesus knows that we are in a season of growth. He knows that we haven't arrived yet. And he continues to show us grace when we you know, make these bold claims, when our um, actions don't line up with our convictions or our statements. Jesus is so gracious towards us. So in the waiting, yes, that's going to happen, but know that Jesus has grace that is uh, abundant for us. I want to then quickly look at Martha. And in verses 23 to 25, his interaction with her, he says, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And then Jesus says to her this, you know, I am statement, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Now, although Martha here was demonstrating a reasonable level of faith, you know, by making these statements about Jesus, we still have to assume it was more head knowledge for her than a deep heart conviction. Because as the story went on, when Jesus actually went out to the tomb, and he asked for the stone to be moved, it was Martha that actually actually um, sort of protested against, against that, saying, ah, oh, Lord, it's been four days, it's going to stink. And there's not really a great demonstration of faith in her saying that. It's like she didn't really believe what Jesus was saying. And again, what Jesus wants to do here is he wants to offer himself to us not just a head knowledge, not just a religion, not just something we know about in our mind, but a deep conviction, a deep relationship we know in our heart that encapsulates all of who we are. I can imagine Jesus when this little scenario took place and, and Martha goes, yeah, I know he will rise again in the resurrection. And that was a, a common thought taught in Jewish culture. Yes, the end day is coming and resurrection is going to happen. And Jesus is like, no, no, Martha. And I imagine him looking her in the eye and saying, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. And Jesus continues to say that to people all the time. It's this invitation where he's saying, I am the life. I am the resurrection. Uh, we can know that. We can find that in the person of Jesus uh, as he pours out his spirit upon us. Uh, we don't want to be, I guess, like Martha, who just sort of makes these claims, we know the right thing to say, oh, yes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me in the head knowledge without actually living that out. Um, you know, you might say, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And you say it with um, a somber tone. You know, we can have these things where it's head knowledge, but not heart knowledge. And Jesus is saying, no, no, I want to I wanna show myself. I want to offer myself to you. I am the resurrection and the life. I am all you need. Um, perhaps that's something that you need to be reminded of today. As we look to Mary, um, the feeler, who I'm calling in this story, it says that um, Jesus desires, one well, doesn't say that, the, the point we get from this is Jesus desires to reveal his heart 
for us. It's a little like a little bit before we looked at Jesus' humanity. Uh, and in verses 32 to 33, where he's having this interaction with Mary, uh, it says, Mary reached the place where Jesus was, saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked, come and see, Lord, they replied, and Jesus wept. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we can know that Jesus sees our pain. Uh, we know that he knows our need and wants to reveal his heart of love towards us. Um, maybe you're in a season right now where you feel like maybe God has actually rejected your plea for help. Maybe you've been calling out to God and you're like, you know what, I just don't even know that he cares. But this story should act as a reminder that he is with you and that he cares so deeply for you. Jesus sees what you're going through. He understands and he wants to draw near to you. He wants you to invite him in um, to your space, even if it's in the waiting. Jesus will provide the way forward. He knows you're hurt. He hears your cries for help. And he longs to comfort you in this time. Um, Mike Wells, a guy we'd like to listen to um, around here in his teachings, he describes great faith not as being uh, how much you can believe God for, but instead great faith is demonstrated by how long you can go and receive nothing. Now that's very uninspiring, but sometimes that is so true uh, that it's in the waiting that our faith is demonstrated uh, more so than in other times. But finally, I just want to look at Lazarus. Now Lazarus, he's got this short role in the story, very important role, Lazarus had to die. Um, and Jesus spoke and gave new life to his body. And the great thing is Jesus is still wanting to do this for everybody today. Uh, and what he's wanting to do here is for Jesus, he's wanting to live his life through us. He's wanting to live his life through us. Now, most believe that death comes after life, but the reversal of Jesus and his kingdom teaches that true life is actually only found after death death. And I'm not talking about physical death. Yes, we're all going to physically die or unless Jesus comes back before then. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about dying to self. Jesus says you will only find life when you lose it. Uh, it's not until you lay your own life down when you die to self that you actually find real life in him. Earlier, we looked at the fact that Jesus' priority is God's will and glory being revealed. Uh, also, by observing the different people in this story, we see that Jesus has a desire to see growth in us. He has a desire to show grace towards us. He has a desire to offer himself to us. He wants to reveal his heart for us. And finally, he wants to live his life through us. Can I suggest that against probably popular teaching, so much of these things are actually developed in the waiting and i know a lot of people don't want to hear that but it is so often true when it comes to god even in this story there was a planned outcome between god and his son from the very beginning to the very end but we can see that none of the other people in this story knew what was happening along the way all they did was question each step i wonder how much that is true for us i wonder how much that might be true for the season you're in uh, there are so many times that God works in ways that brings us to the end of ourselves in order that we would find true life in him, that we would be born again. Uh, so wherever you're at today, whatever you're facing, there may be a dream that has died. Perhaps there's a broken relationship that you're hoping could be restored. You could be facing financial stress or whatever it is. You could be waiting for a physical healing or you simply need a breakthrough in some way. Be reminded of Jesus' statement. He is the resurrection and the life. Bring your request before him. Place your confident hope in him. And trust that even if there is a season of waiting, God knows what he is doing. God is doing something. He is unfolding his will. He will reveal his glory. Uh, and in the process, he's going to stimulate growth. He's going to show grace. He'll offer himself. He'll reveal his heart. And it's his desire to breathe new life in you and through you. Let's pray together. Jesus, thank you for this story. Thank you for the way that you uh, demonstrated that you are the resurrection 
and the life. We bring before you right now a whole bunch of different situations, uh, wherever we're at, uh, whatever's going on in our world, whatever we need from you, we bring that before you because you've invited us to bring our requests to you. But we just want to say we trust in you. We know that you know what you're doing. Uh, so we place our, our confident hope in you today. We ask that you breathe new life in us and through us. Uh, do what only you can do. Bring a breakthrough. Uh, if it's in your timing, Lord, we, we look to you and you alone. And uh, we commit all these things to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bless you guys.
Hey, like I said, we've got some cracking good news, haven't we? Thanks so much for that, guys. That was great. Yeah, that was great. And we hope that you've had a wonderful time worshipping and learning through all that's happened here today. And mm. we, our hope is that you take uh, something of the message out to the week with you. Maybe yeah. this challenge that you're going to act on, uh, an encouragement to be Jesus wherever you are mm. this week. Yeah. And um, yeah, keep keep that sense of worship going on through the week. Just keep singing yeah. songs of praise to the Lord. Yeah. Hey, thanks, Luke, for that message too. That was cracking good. This Jesus is series is just keeping us centered in the, yeah. the the way that Jesus demonstrated life. He put his mission in our hands, didn't he? So he, did. he he's still alive uh, through through us in the way that we go out into the community. So keep going after the one. Hey, look, if you're uh, visiting here, you've you sort of happened upon New Vine. This is all a new experience for us. Please um, use the information there on the web site to drop us an email uh, let us know who you are or anything that we can do to help we welcome you and uh, yeah everyone have a wonderful week bless well, you guys wherever you are on the planet go with God yeah cheers <laughs>